Thank you very much. Uh, um, welcome, I'm Luciano D'Andrea, Knowledge and Innovation, and welcome to the round table on engaging men in gender equality work. This uh, round table is organizing, organized under the Gender Equality Academy project, GE Academy. GE Academy is an EC funded project aimed to develop and implement high capacity uh, a building program uh, on gender equality and uh, uh, in research and innovation and higher education. The program targets different groups, researchers, uh, human resource officers, equality officers and other stakeholders. It includes uh, different components like in-person trainings, interactive and participatory workshops, summer schools, distributed open collaborative courses, interactive webinars, train the trainer sessions. More information on the project are available on the project website. And uh, training materials are also available on YouTube channels of the project, Gender Equality Academy EU. The project is uh, carried out by a consortium of 12 partners led by Vilabs. And now the engaging men in gender equality work. Uh, although the engaging men is often evoked as a necessary to address gender inequality, uh, the issue is largely overlooked. This is also due to the complexity of the process. For example, getting involved entails for men to trigger personal process of change in order to overcome their conformity to masculine norms but this is a very difficult process to undertake. Moreover, male's engagement is often based on a self-centered and so a male-centered view of gender inequality, so that they risk not fully understanding the women's perspective of gender inequality, thus reproducing gender biases. Again, more promoting men's involvement can sometimes run the risk of further empowering men this is quite paradoxical, without actually changing their attitudes and their behavior patterns. This should, could lead to reproduce forms of benevolent sexism. Men do not have a homogeneous experience of male privilege, nor of masculinity itself. This adds complexity in the picture, requiring to go beyond the male to female binary position. For all these reasons too, a consolidated stock of knowledge and especially practical tools to support men's involvement within research organizations are still lacking. The risk is that the engagement of men in gender equality remains a man's personal affair and that gender equality keeps on being viewed as a women's problem only. This round table is precisely aimed at to explore the possibility to boost the involvement of men in institutional change processes, starting from the experience of six men directly involved with gender equality work. As for the agenda after this presentation, uh, two rounds of the round tables will be organized, uh, one before and one after the coffee break. Each round will include two components, an exchange among the panelists and a question and answer session. A wrap up session will follow and the last 10 minutes of the meeting will be devoted to the evaluation of, uh, of this round table uh, by the participants. Uh, some technicalities, participants can use the chat box to ask questions and make comments throughout the session. A couple of polls will be launched during the session. Uh, the second is particularly important because uh, we will ask participants about the issues to be discussed in the second round of the round table. Uh, participants are warmly invited to fill in the evaluation questionnaire after the wrap up session. Filling in the questionnaire requires only a few minutes but it's particularly important for us in order to enhance our uh, training program. Uh, the link to the evaluation questionnaire will be made available on the chat booth. And finally, we recommend all participants using the chat booth to be considerate and respectful to all uh, while sending messages or uh, posing questions uh, or comments. 
uh, the uh, roundtable will be moderated by Francisco Pais Rodriguez. Francisco is former team member of the Supera project at the University of Coimbra. Supera project is a project aimed at uh, launching uh, gender equality plans in different uh, research organizations all over Europe. Now he is member of the Pan-European Network of Gender Trainers established under the G Academy project. That's all. Thank you for your participation. Thank you to be here and I give the floor to uh, Francisco. Thank you very much, Luciano. Good morning, everyone. I will start by summarizing the, the expectations that were filled in the um, ex-ante questionnaires. And we do see that we have a fairly mixed group of, of people here, from beginners to experts on the topics at hand, mostly academics, but also varied in terms of employment positions. We have HR officers, management, equal opportunity officers, even communication officers. In terms of academics, we see mostly people from social sciences, but also natural sciences and even some STEM, some people in STEM fields, which will be very interesting once we start the discussion, I believe. The main expectations you posed was you wish to be familiarized with strategies and approaches for engaging men in a very practical way and getting inspiration from mutual learning and exchange. Also, there's the very important fact that we are here to sensitize about the importance of engaging men and hopefully to, to go beyond that in further sessions as you um, start we start to put in practices the, 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 the thoughts you might hear in this session. Well, you, you, most, of, most of our participants were, were very uh, keen on having pra practical advices, wanting to know about principles, methods, and tools for G work and creating gender equality plans, creating an equal work environment, and the sustainability of su such actions. Well, there's all, all obviously the issue that brings us all here, how to engage men in gender equality work and very, various dimensions were mentioned through discourse, political and institutional actions, and how to show men even how they are armed by patriarchy. Overcoming resistances was also a recurring topic um, and especially how to engage male leaders who are not interested in gender equality, particularly in STEM fields, some of you asked for. There's also other topics we, we, we would like to see addressed here or intersectionality, economic inequality, ethnic background, LGBTQ plus issues, and the gender perceptions of, of gender equality in itself, or even how to change the disproportion between men and women in specific fields. Here STEM was mentioned again. How to deal with gender inequality deniers, then again, the, the resistances, and how to uh, create non biased science. So, in a jiffy, this is what our participants uh, wrote about their expectations for this session. And I now introduce our panelists. Apologies in advance, of course, for any mispronunciations of the names. I'm only a Portuguese native speaker. I'll do it. Um, I'll do it. Of in alphabetic order. Franz Wong is, a, is currently a junior senior, senior integration specialist at Stanford University in Northern California and has worked as a gender specialist and advisor with many organizations including UN Women and other UN agencies, Oxfam and the Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam. His published work includes various topics of gender and gender mainstreaming, and notably the integration of a gender dimension in agricultural studies. Henry van Lunen, apologies for the pronunciation, is the Director of Operations at the Netherlands Cancer Institute and has been for over two decades. His academic work uh, focused in molecular biology and genetics, and together with the Director of Research, he tries to facilitate their very extensive group of research, researchers by creating a, a, a place to work, develop, and have a good time as well. He has experience in designing and in implementing a GEP with the, within the EU-funded library project. Jean-Michel Monod is the founder of and president of All Inclusive, a consultancy firm that, boosts on, that works on boosting performance through inclusion itself. 
He is also a facilitator at Men Advocating Real Change, an, an initiative committed to inspire men to leverage their unique position and opportunity to be advocates for equity. He is also a member of the French Higher Council for Gender Equality and co-authored a book titled Gender, ba Gender Balance, When Men Step Up. Marcel Krauss, again, pronunciation, I'm sorry, is an R&D program designer and manager at, at the technology agency of the, the Czech Republic, the, at the National Research Funding Organization, and a project leader of hib 4 city a, a strategic project for innovation at the Charles University of Prague. Also a member of the International Council at, the, uh, um, of, at Policy and Evidence Center. His work focuses mainly on innovative potential of social sciences, humanity, arts, on inclusive, inclusivity and gender equality in research and innovation and creative economy. Maroon Mujaber, senior scientific officer at the Mediterranean Agron Agronomic Institute of Bari, was part of the design and implement implementation of a GEP within the framework of the Gender Smart Process Project, which focuses in gender and science management for agriculture and life sciences including research and teaching. His academic work focuses on agrarian engineering and life science. Tausif Nauman, my colleague at the GE Academy, is a researcher and gender medicine expert in, and also a, technology, a technologist with a master's degree in com computer sciences. He's the director of tech communications at the International Society of Gender in Medicine and his, his work focus area is the identification and characterization of sex and gender differences and developing methodologies for their analysis, the development of databases for scientific study co-works, cohorts and working with gender medicine epidemiology. And these are our panelists, as you can see, a varied group with various different expertise that will surely contribute to the discussion. I will now launch. I will all no, launch our first poll so that we can get our brains going on in this subject. You can see it on your screens that most of you found um, found the, the involvement of men towards the success of gender equality initiatives to be crucial and the rest relevant. So it's very evident that people here are, are enthusiastic about the topic we're discussing at hand. So let's get going to not waste any more time. And I will start in alphabetical order as I did uh, with Franz Wong, which will have five to six minutes to share with us a bit of his personal experience and thoughts on the matter. Franz, please take the floor. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I do want to start by saying I was hesitant to join this group and speak about, um, and I think this refers to some of the opening comments. It, it seems counterintuitive to join an all-male panel, arguably the most ubiquitous symbol of male dominance in academia, to talk about how to involve men in gender equality. This is not just an intellectual musing, but a starting place for my sharing. I struggle as a man to promote gender equality for the last 20, 30 years, particularly through the transformation of structures of power and privilege, has been to figure out how to do this from the position of power and privilege based on gender, as well as race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and class. How do we not reproduce the structures of dominance as, as we're challenged to do so in the opening comments? I don't think we figured this out. We, meaning men working for gender equality, formally or informally, we tend to use strategies of other movements for equality. For instance, it's the women's movement, such as organizing, mobilizing, involving. In international development, which is I'm most familiar with, men's organizations are in the thick of the mainstream of the development industry, which one could argue has its foundations in white male-centered development. Just look at the bedrocks of the leading European tropical uh, medicine organizations such as the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, or the Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam, where I used to work, or the gendered implications of the emphasis of economic development and GDP and how the care economy has been implicated or not. If these are the gendered structures we have inherited, we need to reckon with them as their benefactors. I wanted to share an anecdote to illustrate this a little bit more about the reproduction of gender equity, even if it's in the name of promoting gender equality. Years ago, I was working with a number of men's groups who were struggling small NGOs. Very sincere, but they asked me how to institutionalize become sustainable. 
And I told them, this is exactly what we should not be doing. We don't need another male-dominated organization leading the change for women. What has been helpful is to reflect about change from a position of privilege. What does this mean? It means being acutely aware of the space I take up, such as this, not taking up the oxygen of my own angst of being a man, hence my aversion for panels such as this, within the wider context of the struggle for equality. Understanding what is needed is working with the subaltern and prioritizing that. What I've learned is, what I've also learned is there are lessons to be, to be taken from other struggles, uh, from either from the position of being dominated, such as the case of the Palestinian struggle against occupation, or the position of domination, such as those working with their white privilege and their careful and sensitive allyship with those living with intergenerational systemic racism. I'm thinking of the work, for example, of Robin DiAngelo in the US. I take to heart her and others' advice. Do the work to dismantle privilege. There are no quick fixes, there are no tools, there are no framework. It's a lifelong commitment of reflection and working at chipping away powers of structure. And doing it in a way that does not take the space of those who are actually at the front line of that struggle. Much of my work invariably has been, and it has been given, given the focus of gender mainstreaming, has, it has been with men. And this has been through training. And I'm referring to training that is old school, problem posing, facilitated, ultimately subversive. And I take my, my, my inspiration from subversion from, from feminism, and I'm referring to feminism as an anecdotal lens, as solidarity as movement, and as a belief system and practice, such as living feminist pedagogies in the classroom. What is most helpful is to think of the context we're trying to affect change. What's particular about promoting gender equality research organizations? Is it the same about working with government institutions, multilateral organizations, financial sectors? Is there something particular? And I notice I'm using the word particular, not different. My sense is the work with research organizations is about understanding the epistemological basis. What constitutes legitimate knowledge and ways of learning? What ontological perspectives dominate? How do these reinforce gendered power and privilege in terms of researchers? What is research? What is promoted as the truth? With this perspective, we start to get to, get to the systemic basis of gender inequality in academia and research and knowledge making. And I hope as researchers, men and women in academia would be inspired by this intellectual pursuit for gender justice. Um, I think I've taken up my time, but I just want to conclude here circling back to the issue of panels. And I did notice that we as panelists represent privilege beyond gender. And I would encourage organizers in the, in the future to think about as our introductory comments that men are not a homogeneous group, that we should be looking at other ways of being and, and expressing our masculinity. Thank you very much. Thank you, friends. Very interesting insights and theoretical perspectives as well. I would now give the floor to Henry van Lunen. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you to the organizers for uh, arranging this round table. I think it's a very uh, exciting subject and uh, I hope we, we can share our exper experience and expertise in this, this meeting. Um, yeah, why I'm involved in this, it's, well, to give you, I, I would like to share an, an, an anecdote about what, what made me realize how important this is. And it all comes back to um, an, a very inter, uh, international, very uh, fruitful collaboration we had on gender equality, which is called the, the Libra Project. And some of the members of the Libra Project or the former Libra Project are uh, among the, the, the people present in this meeting. Um, during many of the meetings, uh, at that time those were physical meetings, fortunately, uh, we. I was the only man around the table and all the other participants were female. And I felt very welcome because all the, the people around the table, they, they really uh, welcomed everybody. And I was also as the only man there felt very welcome. But it made me realize how difficult it is uh, for, for women if you're in, in the opposite situation where you're the only female on a, on a panel, in a committee, on a board, because it's really, creates a, a difficult situation, awkward situation. I felt awkward at certain moments, being the only man. Um, I felt less inclined to, at certain moments, to, to speak out, to, to share my opinion about certain topics. And I must say, I do have opinions about certain topics. So, uh, you know, it felt really difficult sometimes. And 
Although, again, I would really like to share, stress that I felt very welcome and they, they, they were very open to me and there was no hostility whatsoever, but I found it very difficult. And that made me realize that we really need to change and, and create gender equality uh, because I now experience myself and it was difficult. It was really hard. So um, that, that really opened my eyes that it's important to, to have really gender equality. Uh, on panels in, in 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 every kind of situation in in, in our work and private situation etc. I also feel very fortunate that at our institute, at the Netherlands Cancer Institute, um, I think we're we're doing pretty okay. Uh, there is a uh, large commitment from the board of directors. Um, as as a as a director of operations, I'm also involved in gender equality, and there's a lot of support for that. So in our institute, although we don't have gender equality at all levels, and we still need to improve further. Um, I feel very uh, fortunate to, to work in this environment, which is very friendly and open to the subject. But there are, I, I, I do realize that there are other organizations, um, situations where this is not the case, and we really should um, help those organizations those, uh, to reach gender equality. And I really would like to stress that it's about gender equality. It's about all the different genders that, that should have equal opportunities. It's not an, a man problem, not a female problem, a women problem. It's really something we have to work on together. And um, I think that that's for me the most important uh, driving power to, to contribute to this and contribute to this, uh, this meeting. And having been in this position, I, I have some practical solutions maybe that we could share later on. And I think that I'm, I'm very open to, to other suggestions how we further can improve this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we'll surely ask you to develop a bit further on those practical solutions. Uh, I will now give the floor to Mr. Mono. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's been five years since I started my own consultancy boutique, which is called All Inclusive. And I must say that uh, I'm very happy that I have a lot of work, even in this crazy period. And if I'm honest, I realize that probably one of the reasons why I'm quite successful is the fact that I am a man. I am a man and I'm very often called by companies, especially by women in companies, and they ask me, you know, we need a man to talk to men because they don't listen to us. Uh, and being one of the few males uh, working full time on this topic is definitely a competitive advantage, which I would never, I've never thought about before. But uh, that was uh, that was the case. So I started also to work concretely on diversity and inclusion 15 years ago, when I was appointed as a vice president of diversity and inclusion for Sodexo, the French uh, global company. Uh, and one of the first things I had to do. Uh, after a couple of days in, uh, in this role was to attend a huge event in France, which is called the Women's Forum that uh, is organized, that was organized at least uh, every year uh, in Normandy, in Deauville, so very close to where I live. And the first time I went there, to make it short, it was uh, something like 1,000 women and me. And to be very clear, it made me feel very, very different for the first time because I've always been part of the majority. Uh, the men's club uh, is uh, something I've been happily uh, walking in uh, during all my career, almost. But this time it's been really uh, an eye opener. Um, I realized that while we were working to promote gender equality within uh, uh, an international company that we had made this mistake to focus only on, on, uh, on women, uh, saying, okay, we have a problem with women. At, at least, at, actually not, we do not have a problem with women. Women have a problem. So we need to train them, we need to mentor them, to sponsor them, to make them more, more assertive, more this, more this, more this, more this, blah, blah, blah. And uh, no point uh, about men. So progressively, it, it came uh, visible that, of course, we needed to involve 100% of, uh, of the population in, in this work. And that's definitely what I do uh, in, in my current job, because I do support companies uh, with consulting trainings and conferences. And I see this topic uh, growing, and there are more and more requests from uh, 
organizations to to be supported to include their men especially coming from the the gender networks who are very often women networks in companies in private organization and at some point they realize that they need to engage men and they uh, they are struggling in finding uh, solutions to make their work attractive for men they usually have something like 10 or 20 percent of uh, of uh, men attending those uh, events and workshops and that's definitely a, a huge amount of work to be done um, as, uh, as you said, Francisco, I'm partnering with the US organization Catalyst in their MARC program, MARC meaning Men Advocating Real Change. And uh, I love the way they, they, uh, they address it, saying that if men are not in, there are some reasons. It's not just because they are stupid. Some are, but not all of them. Um, but probably because there are three main factors. First one is ignorance. They don't know that they don't know. And uh, if you don't know that you don't know, you have no problem. There is no uh, gap between what you know and what uh, should be the, the reality. So that's where we need uh, to educate, to uh, train people, to involve them, to provide them with uh, uh, opportunities at a personal level to realize. There is also some apathy thinking, thinking OK, there may be a problem, but it's not my problem, and I have no role to play here. So we need to, uh, to engage them in helping them to understand why uh, they need to be in and what they can get from it. And the other one is fear. So they can be feared thinking, uh, OK, uh, if, if they win, I will lose as a man. Or if I do something, I may be, um, um, I may be saying the, the bad, bad things or with the wrong role, so I do not dare to do things. So there is a lot of education that needs to be uh, achieved, at least in, uh, in private organizations, uh, which I'm uh, working with. But I think it's not only for the private sector. It's, of course, true for, uh, for everyone. Uh, it, it's a journey, so it will take time. But we really need to change our mindset, thinking we are not looking at women, but at gender. It's been said uh, from the very beginning. And we are lacking of male role models even if I see some hap uh, um, uh, happening, but it's uh, still at the very early stages. So a lot uh, of opportunities. I invite men to join this community of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, professionals. There is space for all of us in, in here too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting perspective on how to leverage men to, to or men leveraging their unique position to improving organizations in this matter. Uh, Marcel Cross, please. Yes, uh, hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Marcel Kraus, uh, as you heard, and uh, I would like to say that I'm representing here the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic, which is a research funding organization, national research funding organization. And also uh, I'm representing here the Czech project the project financed from the resources for European Union. So uh, I work for the funding organization and uh, I would like to share with you a short story about how it happened that I became seven years ago a gender manager. Uh, so uh, seven years ago, the funding agency has a female president. And once she came to, to the staff uh, she mentioned that it would be nice to deal with gender equality in research funding too. Yeah. But uh, and she asked, is here someone interesting in this topic? And yeah, no one raised the hands but me. Uh, I had previous experience from Germany uh, for several years. And uh, yeah, the environment in academia was a little bit different and more sensitive to gender equality. So I said to myself in the Czech Republic, back in the Czech Republic, that <laughs> why, why not to deal with it in, in our country too? Yeah. So I write the hand. I'm interested in the topic. I can try. So uh, that's, that was the very beginning, uh, maybe motivating by the willingness to achieve something new, to create a new innovative way how to provide support for research projects. And maybe the very personal uh, motivation is um, 
uh, maybe the sense for justice. Why not to be more gender sensitive or inclusive aware? Why not uh, strive for finding new resources for innovation, for new technologies, for, I don't know, uh, STEM-based applications, etc. So this was, uh, this was uh, the reason or moment how I became a gender manager seven years ago. Um, uh, but of course, uh, there's a difference uh, between research performing organizations and research funding organizations in terms of gender equality uh, agenda. Uh, we are focusing on uh, different measures for researchers, different incentive and tools. Uh, for example, we have to deal with the eligibility of costs uh, related with work-life balance. Is those costs uh, eligible as an expenditure in research projects or not? Yeah? So uh, those questions we have to deal with. Of course, evaluation process. This is uh, something what, uh, what differ from the performing organizations. We need to be gender sensitive in evaluating projects. And maybe we have the power to introduce new evaluation criteria. For example, uh, the evaluation of the gender dimension in the research content or innovation content. Yeah? It means that the funding organization has a, a power to change things. And we used this power to change the gender sensitive culture in the whole ecosystem in the Czech Republic, research ecosystem. Mm. Of course, we faced uh, several obstacles uh, with, uh, yeah, on this journey for the greater gender equality in research funding organizations. I would like to highlight once, um, of course, we, we, we faced, for example, yeah, resistances. Yeah, that's a very typical and very, very <laughs> big and sus uh, yeah, sustaining problem, resistances. We need to explain why we are doing it, where is the added value for, uh, of it, etc. And uh, what I would like to mention is, uh, is the following thing. We are actually two persons dealing with gender equality measures implementation. It is me, male manager, and my colleague Jana Dvořáčková, female colleague. Yeah. Uh, we call ourselves as a, as a mother and scully yeah, in, in our organization. So we, we create a pair uh, responsible for gender equality uh, measures and cultural uh, change towards greater gender sensitivity in our organization. But uh, yeah, the biggest obstacle would, uh, which I would mention from my point of view for this occasion of this workshop is the prejudices and maybe stereotypes of uh, men on against men. Because uh, I, uh, I have to deal with, with my own stereotypes against men and uh, stereotypes against myself in terms of using the privilege which is dedicated for men. Yeah. For example, the inclination to patriarchy or the saber syndrome. I can do it, don't worry. <laughs> or the willingness to win the situation. I need to yeah, win the race. Um, maybe a little bit, yeah, tolerated sexism or yeah, time to time, some, some, some notes which are not correct of uh, pretending to be funny. Yeah? So this is uh, something that I uh, needed to deal with and to be more sensitive to myself and to be aware about my privi privilege and try to, uh, to avoid it or to, to be yeah, self-reflective. And other thing, what we experienced is that uh, the others hoped stereotypes against me as a man. Yeah, uh, stereotypes, uh, stereotypes of others towards the person of male gender manager. For example, we can we could hear several times. Yes, Marcel is uh, uh, courageous. She's brave. Uh, 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 when he is dealing with gender equality. Yeah, good, good job. Or uh, Marcel should uh, represent our organization in the government round tables. Or Marcel is, uh, is annoying, but we kind of like him. It's cute. Or uh, yeah, uh, whereas my female colleague, she's been uh, often told or 
maybe implicitly as a freak feminist. Yeah? So this disbalance between the man being a gender manager and female being the gender manager um, is something what stepped into consideration when, uh, when uh, thinking about the role of man in, a, in a gender equality measures or cultural change. So this would be all, all for, the, for the introduction or thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting that point about men being uh, seen with better eyes when engaging in feminism and gender equality work as opposed to women who often have to face difficulties. I, I invite strongly invite our, our audience members to ask questions and post comments in the chat box as we're seeing always active Maxime providing a, us with some in, very interesting insights. Maroon, please take the floor. Thank you, Francisco, for giving me the floor. And uh, I would like to thank Gender GE Academy for inviting me for uh, this uh, interesting uh, panel. So as uh, you introduced me, I'm an agriculture engineer. I'm, uh, I work uh, mostly in agriculture. And uh, nowadays, I'm coordinating a Marie Curie project on uh, combating Zellella fastidiosa. It's a bacteria killing olive trees in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and um, in the last six, seven years, I'm a lot in joint programming. Joint programming means putting funding agencies together. And uh, in 2006, uh, 2016, I was in South Africa for the kickoff meeting of an internet co-fund. During the social dinner, we discussed politics with several colleagues at our table, especially in the Middle East, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a Lebanese origin. A few weeks later, I received a message from someone who, I, who was with us during the discussion. He told me how interesting our talks were and asked me if we wanted to join a proposal on gender equality. It took a few days to study the topic and pass the message to our director, who immediately agreed on the proposal. For the proposal, we had a meeting in Brussels with other, other partners, and together with my colleague, we were a bit shy about our result as the other partners were from prestigious European institutions. To my great surprise, our difficulties and bottlenecks were almost the same as those of the other partners. It truly made me think how these issues of equality and equity are deeply rooted and that my cultural background from the Middle East could be in added value, giving the sensitivity and the daily struggle for equality and equity to achieve justice. Thinking out of your comfort zone was the first lesson learned, and I applied it in the composition of the team working on the project. The proposal was accepted, and I found myself at the kickoff meeting of Gender Smart in Montpellier, where I realized that I had put myself in an uncomfortable situation. By shifting my work from project coordination, negotiating with funding agencies, to a structural change project and that most of my colleagues and other institutions were much more advanced with this issue. I therefore experienced difficulties in filling our knowledge gaps and managing our part of the project properly. If you think you know people, don't say so before addressing issues of equality, equity, and justice with them. I could not imagine how many nasty and pleasant surprises could come out of these discussions and how we take many situations for granted without paying attention to other people who suffer from them. The first obst obstacle was to fine tune my mentality to enrich my knowledge of gender equality. After all, the rule I follow in life is, it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness, which means before asking others what they are doing for change, ask yourself what you have done and what you could do better to induce change. And in this task, I'm undoubtedly facilitated by my cultural and geographical background, by my resilience having been born and lived in a country ravaged by civil wars and now plunged into economic crisis. The second is with my colleagues who are used to seeing me work on specific topics and then maybe start making some jokes about this new approach. But every joke said in front or behind me made me more determined and convinced to go ahead with this. Then also in the implementation of this structural change that raise strange perceptions. People look at you and you see in their eyes that they are telling you that you are crazy. 
people who are afraid of losing power and privileges. And here I would like to point out that this category of people is independent of gender and is entirely linked to power. People accepting and believing in what you are doing. So you start to create a critical mass and you start to see how this process could improve everyone's life, regardless of their gender and culture. Resistances and how to convince people to change. Furthermore, as from 2021, to be eligible to funding for Horizon Europe, you need a gender equality plan made our life easier, at least at our institution level. My institution has never addressed a gender mainstreaming policy in the past, although women empowerment have been has been the topic of some project actions mainly developed by female colleagues. Being appointed as gender smart project leader for Siam was unexpected and also very enthous uh, enthusiastic for me. I could contribute a male perspective to the Department of Gender Policy and Culture, which is generally addressed mainly by, with a female lens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another great institutional perspective and the ever ever present view that structural change is hard on many levels institutionally but also personally tasif would you please take the floor thank you very much francisco for giving me an opportunity and i thank the gender academy team for the providing this opportunity and highlighting very interesting topic and i believe uh, like my friend uh, Marun said, as well as uh, Franz and Marshall, I think the, we, we always talk about the organizations and I, I have learned my experience because I'm a data analyst and I play around with the data and I think these facts uh, makes you believe a lot compared to uh, having uh, just the organizational work. And the psychological saying is, uh, which is uh, research that it takes only less than six seconds to change your mind, whether uh, it's about uh, making a decision or making a choice. But we also know the behavioral change is the most difficult one. So saying this, I would like get to some of the scientific facts, which we have, uh, which are known by now that three out of four homeless men, uh, there are three out of four homeless are men and three out of four men lack the close friendships and also the 70 percent of the suicides uh, are committed by men and the 90 percent the 90 percent of the fatal car accidents are actually caused by men so having said this this is the stats which tells us that not only men uh, or the women are in the streamline of the gender. Gender is not binary to me and to many of my friends. Gender is actually a linear process and it involves your gender roles, your gender identity. And we are only talking about at the moment gender identity. It also has two other important roles, uh, which is gender relations and institutionalized gender. And having said that, in my experience, I found out that we mostly talk about the institutionalized gender, which is the power between men and women. And then we are mostly talking about only the gender identity, which is talking about only being a man or woman in a society, let's say the biological man or uh, male or biological female. But uh, what if we consider and look further, I experienced myself that uh, it was not easy to acknowledge. And once I started acknowledging that the, these are the facts that the men is at the risk of not being discussed, of not being involved, of not being allies to the whole process, we, are, we felt left out. And I felt left out at many times and I had to engage myself to be more realistic. And then I figured out that, okay, if we get involved, we get to learn. If we acknowledge, we start accomplishing. So we have to acknowledge to start uh, having the accomplishment. I remember my first uh, day at the uh, uh, Institute of Gender in Medicine back in 20, 
2010. When I was there, I was uh, just attending one of the lecture and I was quite impressed with the scientific fact that uh, women lives longer than the men and the men has a shorter average life in the whole world. And then I realized another fact that the whole research, the scientific research was actually focusing men, but still the men was at the higher risk of having the cardiovascular diseases compared to other diseases. And there are certain diseases where women were at the high risk compared to men. And I realized that this is actually the fact that needs to be understood and to be explained to all the counterparts. And I remember when I started talking about it to my social circle and given the fact as uh, Marun said, that uh, given the cultural background, once you talk about it, it gets to be, uh, you gets to be labeled as the feminist approach person. And unfortunately that's true. So I have the Indian continent uh, background. So where we started and I, I remember, uh, thanks to my sister, she's highly qualified and uh, specialized in the pediatric uh, surgery. So she, she accepted and she talked about a lot more after listening to the facts and we realized that uh, she was in a good position to talk in the Institute as well, but still she also has a very uh, strange kind of uh, social discrimination in the way that it's uh, more of the feminist and the social thing and nothing to do with the medical or medicine or medical sciences. But the thing is slowly and with the passage of time, once you put up the facts, they start to realize it's hard to admit maybe in front of everyone if we would start asking, but if we keep acknowledging we are making the society, we are the communities. I am a big part of one community. We all have to accept. And once we start doing it, we would be making the organizations. We would be heading the um, many other institutions. And then slowly we put up our efforts to make the differences. I would end because I, I was reading through the comments of a lot of participants and most of them were interested in bringing up the strategies. What strategies we can bring to uh, engage Ben? And it's a very important actually question. I always asked myself when I was in the scientific career and I always wanted to do the research based on the gender, but I didn't know the methodologies. I didn't know the approaches. And uh, having said that, given the interest of the time, I would just say two statements that what strategies can be involved. I think the initiatives need to engage men as allies uh, using the positive and relevant messages, which also address the concerns of the men. This is how we would engage more and more men. Thank you very much. And I hope we would have more room for the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasif. We were now seeing some questions in the chat box. What do the men's thinkers think about this? Why do they think it is important for men that, that women are equi equally respected at work, in work meetings, etc.? Why does he see the, as the advantage of this equality, especially in STEM? Does any of our panelists want to take the stage and try to answer this intricate question? Well, maybe uh, since I'm from STEM, <laughs> uh, I could uh, uh, start a discussion. Um, if I understand correctly, the question is, uh, why should we uh, aim for uh, gender equality? Uh, I think that that's the bottom line of the question. I, I think what we should aim for in, in organizations is to have equal opportunities for everybody and create teams that are diverse and, uh, and open so that everybody can uh, yeah, flourish and, and um, expand their, their, their possibilities, their, their capabilities. Because combining the different uh, backgrounds, um, both gender, race, religion, age, etc., is really creating teams that are very, very productive. Um, in, in our institutes, um, I, I often see that teams are very much like the team leader, you know, as a, as a, as a group leader, as a uh, supervisor, people tend to select people that are more or less the same as they are. 
And that's a big, uh, well, it can be very dangerous because then everybody thinks the same. And it's very important to have very diverse teams. And this especially also holds true for gender. So in order to do the best, in, the, in our case, the best science, you need to involve uh, diverse um, persons, um, including uh, gender. Can I jump in? No. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think the, the first thing to say for me is that we are always looking for good reasons for men to act. Uh, actually, we should uh, just start by saying that it, it's, uh, it's absolutely normal. There is no, no way uh, this should not be a topic for men uh, uh, as well. It's a question of values, human values. So before looking for something better, it's discrimination is not acceptable at all. That's one, but still there are some um, um, elements that may help you understand. And above all, when we address collective intelligence, I don't know if you know that research that was conducted at MIT and Carnegie Mellon about measuring the IQ of a group of people. And uh, there are two main uh, lessons from this uh, research is one, the group IQ has nothing to do with the individual IQ of, of its members, which is good to know. And the other one is, and uh, the Harvard Business Review made it very provocative saying, what makes a team, a team smarter? More women. Uh, it was not saying replace uh, uh, men by women, but let's have balance. And gender balance is 40 to, to 60 percent of each gender. Having balanced teams make the team smarter. So, and it would be true for generations, for uh, origins, or whatever. So this is a good, good reason to act. Thank you. We do have a question coming from Facebook Live, and uh, saying, "Can you define three strategies or ways, based on your experience, that could help women to proceed with implementations of GPs and make a change?" So, three strategies on that could help women in the implementation of GPs. Maybe leveraging male positions, as we've heard before in the introductory straight statements. Can I uh, maybe jump in, Francisco? Yes, uh, I, 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 I think Marcel also wanted to jump in, but maybe you can take Marcel. Uh, okay, me. Cool. Okay, thank you. Uh, then, and then Franz, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, according to my experience, what might work uh, as a strategy or maybe rather do's because strategy, this is a very big word yeah, for it, uh, is a several uh, tips. Uh, for example, if you would like to engage more men in order to sustain the gender equality plans and activities, uh, there is uh, one possible strategy to, <laughs> to point out the monetization of this uh, activity. Yeah? For example, um, I, I don't know, I mean, you cannot leave the uh, potential of half of society untapped. Yeah, we need to engage them to be part of innovation uh, innovation ecosystem. Or maybe you can point out that uh, public education costs money and we have more female students there than male students, but still we don't have female in STEM subjects in research and innovation. So the female cannot give yeah, back to society their uh, potential. So, those tips might work and they might uh, serve as a tool for opening the eyes of uh, other men or personification of the problem. For example, imagine that your daughter being exposed to sexual harassment yeah? um, or other things, yeah, awaking the, the sense of competitiveness. For example, look, our partner organization abroad is doing the same. We have to yeah, keep up uh, with it. So uh, yeah, those little small strategies based on everyday life of organizations on small talks uh, in, in, in offices uh, could help to open eyes of your male colleagues and to be more gender sensitive. This, this already touches on the question asked in the meantime, the, the important concerns of men are also institutional concerns and the status of institution. Franz, would you care to add on this topic? 
Um, yeah, maybe just the last point person and the one I wanted to raise. I, I think absolutely, and I have practical experience in research organizations where really finding common issues across the gender divide that were gendered as a way of building solidarity. So I think it's also just trying to not reinforce this binary. Um, but the main point I wanted to make is, is um, as a strategy, it's, it's holding men accountable in a sense of when you're look, working with men and particularly looking for early allies, it seems like there's, there's, that, that seems to be a real part, looking for the early adopters and embracing, encouraging. But at the same time, I would say, you know, just showing up for a meeting talking about men isn't good enough, right? Being self-reflective is great. It's not really good enough. I mean, that should have been done 20, 30 years ago. So let's raise the bar and recognize that great that men show up, but let's be accountable for what they do. And think of ways again, that it's about working with men, but not championing men. I really, I get a little privileged re reaction where you have men champions. I mean, how do we think about ways of creating change that don't reproduce basically privilege again, my earlier message. And I think that's about having, um, you know, open conversations that self-reflection and, 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 and holding people accountable and, and encouraging people to hold themselves accountable. And I think that's a way of, of, of and if you are, so one more thing, if you are committed to justice, you're committed to that struggle. And those are the people you want to be working with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting perspective on how to create the, the non-gender discourse in, in organizations. Uh, I, I, I would just ask you to, to direct that, that issue a bit more on how are these, these um, issues uh, not seen or this type of discourse, not, is, is it seen as more resistant or more prone to being resisted by people who are not uh, sensitive to gender equality? And I don't know if I make myself clear. How do resistance emanate when you try to put, put the matters in, into that non-gendered perspective? Francisco, if I understand your question correctly, it's about the resistance and it's, I think, and it's also mentioned in the chat, uh, one of the most powerful ways of resistance is, uh, and it's seen often, I, I must admit, is, is uh, saying that you agree with, with uh, the subject that matter uh, at hand and, and then do nothing. You know, it's easy to say, yes, yes, um, you know, I'm very supportive. And in the end, um, no action is taken, no consequences are taken. So this this lived in uh, this lip surface is, is something that's that's often seen, and it that's very difficult. I, I also find it very difficult. How if people say yes, I fully uh, support, but then at the end of the day, there is no action, no real commitment. And I one way to to get around this and and. Um, because you've also mentioned that it's very important, especially in for research institutes, to come up with data, uh, to show data about about gender inequality or other inequalities. You know, data you cannot dispute, um, and especially in, in scientific organizations, those are those data are a very powerful way of initiating change and especially if those data come from your own institute or your own organization, because not some organization or worldwide, no, your own organization. And then it becomes very tangible. And it's something an organization can also address. It can, can change. You can change your own organization. It's difficult to change the whole world, but you can address uh, those changes in your institute. I see that Frank, Franz wants to intervene. Go on, please. I think Tosif, Tosif had his hand up first, so I'll go after him. Oh, okay. Of course. Well, thank you very much. On that one point. It's okay. Okay. So let's. Uh, on that uh, one point about data. Okay. So I wanted to just uh, make a point regarding the resistance, what my uh, colleague just mentioned. Actually, it's very important to first understand what exactly resistance is and what type of resistance is there. And mostly it's just a blind spot, as uh, uh, my colleague uh, Henry has mentioned. 
that data has the power to change a lot of things. And like, also I would uh, refer to the question what was asked at the Facebook, that what strategies we can um, adopt to bring the change. She wanted to know what kind of strategies we can bring in to have our more involvement and uh, engagement. One of the simplest strategy starts at the very bottom level of us that we just talk about it. And we just talk about the data. We just bring in one of the illustration I like the most where a man is standing in front of the mirror and the woman is standing in front of the mirror and the woman is quite uh, smart, but she looks herself quite bulky and starts even more dieting. And the man is uh, looking at himself, looking as a very uh, thin and handsome guy, though he's quite bulky. So it's how we see ourselves. So we need to hit those blind spots. Once the blind spot is hit, the resistance is reducing slowly, but we need to address. So Franz, thank you very much for giving the opportunity. My pleasure. So to get your hand up first. But just getting to both your points about data, absolutely. And I think to use the process of data and research as a way of awareness raising. And, um, and particularly with research organizations, because they are researchers, and certainly my experience of um, using, I guess, research as participatory processes, if not actually participatory research, as a way to understand these questions that organizations have of themselves. And then therefore, those you know, early adopters or those who are kind of fence sitters are part of this process. So then, in other words, the process of research itself becomes awareness raising of the structures of power in organizations about what the data is telling us and what the data is not telling us again. So it's also opening those questions about what do we constitute as data? And why is it if we had data before, it wasn't actually revealing the things that we wanted it to? And the need for thinking about different data and in particular, um, different ways of collecting data. And that in itself can be an enlightening process and in my experience, quite professionally enriching for researchers because they, they are also professionally developing as well as raising their own consciousness. Thank you. For the last five minutes of this Q&A, yes? Can I jump in? Of course, of course. Please, please. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, what Tasif just uh, said. And uh, for resistances, according to my point of view, uh, we have to understand a little bit uh, uh, better the situation. Because as I, I said in my introduction, I believe uh, most of resistances are um, related to power less, to, less than gender. And it is regardless of the gender of the person. Uh, so um, I believe uh, one convincing issue is our integrity, how ourselves we are behaving. It might be contagious toward other colleagues and other persons at our institution. And it will help, a little, uh, I think, in uh, dealing with resistances. That are important, but uh, um, a good understanding of the process and, of, uh, and the community. Uh, and there is not a ready-made solution for, uh, for that. Thank you. Okay. I cannot see all of our panelists. If anyone wants to jump in, please. Francisco, can I? Uh, I find this uh, topic of resistance is very uh, interesting and important in the same way, way when talking about engagement of men in gender equality issues, because uh, it uh, mostly depends on, uh, on the kind of resistances or, or kind of origin of the resistances, uh, because then you can adjust your communication strategy or principles towards the cause of the resistances of, of men. For example, um, in my uh, own personal experience, uh, I could divide the people I had to be engaged with uh, in, in the gender equality issues in three groups. The first group is a really small group, but the, the group is collaborative. They understand the issue, they are willing to, to, to yeah, know more about, uh, about it. 
then is a big group of in, indifferent people which uh, which are not uh, not pro gender equality not uh, against but uh, yeah uh, and this is the group of people uh, with uh, um with uh, them you have to work and, and try to find the other alliances when they are to be part of the first group and then is the group of notorious uh, resistance uh, arguing uh, and using every opportunity to argue with you and yeah in my experience this is the group of people where it is not yeah, paid off to, to waste energy to talk with them or at least yeah start to, to stay correct and uh, but, but the, uh, yeah the work with, with them is very, very difficult and one um, significant cause of resistances uh, according to my experience in the Czech Republic in the Czech Republic in Central Europe it is important to say is uh, the argument that it the, the gender issues or feminism it has an unpleasant connotation with the socialist and communist establishment in the past where the feminism was uh, yeah, misused for for the uh, ideological and the governmental purposes so uh, this is a one example of, of a possible origin of resistances and when to tackle those resistances you have to be aware where is the origin of, of it so this is one example of, uh, of possible origin of resistances you have to deal with and be prepared on discussions or arguments can i can i jump into francisco yes thank um, you i think if we want to overcome uh, resistance for, especially for men we not we need to organization have to to uh, consider this topic as a very serious topic which means that they first we need to have the full commitment from the top management and uh, which means that they need to be educated because it's not because they are the job that they are educated on, on gender and that's uh, probably the the main issue is how, how to get an access to that uh, board, uh, board room for instance we need to link it to the to the core business of, of uh, the organization also there is no progress without resources which means uh, that you have to take actions and it may cost some money. You may have to, uh, to allocate uh, some people, uh, some resources for, for people or for actions and education, education, education. Again, it's been said quite a lot of times. We know also that uh, the law can help. I read uh, an article yesterday saying that the two countries in Europe where the best gender balance in boardrooms is are Norway and France. And they, they have, uh, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary sorry, of the Copé Zimmerman law in France. It helps also for, for the private sector. And last but not least, I think we need to uh, think about behaviors, behaviors in, in organization. If we want to be inclusive on gender and all other dimensions, we need to focus on how people behave, even if they don't have the, if they don't get the intention, if they behave in the right way, that could be a, Helpful. So working on inclusive behaviors on gender and other dimensions is probably a key way of uh, overcoming resistances. Thank you. I will now conclude this part of our roundtable. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, we've already started a very practical discussion with different topics on, on how, to, how to engage men, but also in a more general sense how to get gender equality measures in, in, um, in place. We, we will now start the, the, the second exchange between, between the panelists and we'll surely um, uh, follow through with what has been, what has been discussed before and, and the questions that have been posed in the final, final 10 minutes of our last Q&A session. Uh, we, we, we will now wait uh, one minute, maybe, for uh, a poll in order for uh, your uh, the participants to start reflecting a bit on how their institution is acting or not uh, with regards to gender equality, so that we can get a practical focus in the second part of our roundtable. Okay, so that's we 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 did have, have some some 
I am not seeing uh, pool number two. Okay, I see it now. Let's start it. Please answer it. There's uh, fortunately only two people said that their organizations are not promoting gender equality at all, but we should strive to, 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 to change this, of course. And then there's a divide between organizations that are actively promoting gender equality and those that are not in a structured way. So what I would invite our panelists uh, to focus on maybe is to, to handle both these topics for maybe organizations that are maybe keen on or that don't have the correct incentives to go through with gender equality and also those who have con concrete planning and have to put specific measures in place. I will now give the floor to any of our any of our panelists who wants to uh, follow through with, with their previous intervention, maybe going with uh, the questions that have been posted in the chat box. Thank you. And Francisco from Tony, shall I just address that and start us off? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Uh, oh, just you Tony can... had... Yes, yeah, Tony. maybe friends, of course, of course. Okay, okay. so just this is about resistance, maybe just jump in. So, so thanks, Tony, it's about uh, my rather vague idea about working with the resistance. So um, for I think, I think it's about, uh, first of all, understanding the nature of the resistance. Um, you know, it's not always obvious it's resistance. It's, it's really understanding what's going on here. And then really understanding what the resistance is about. You know, um, yes, you could always say it's about being threatened about power, but, but what are the other, other other things? And I think by doing that, you um, you start to understand entry points. Is it an uncomfortable with you know your privilege? Is it about you know fear of feminism? What 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 have you? And therefore, your strategies are are about addressing those particular um, um, your your understanding of, of those first two. Um, and it's working with with people are at. And I know it sounds a very vague response about strategies, but I always think you start where you start. You know, no organization tabula rasa. We saw a number of organizations having already things in place and, and you engaging with um, organizations of where they're at. And for me, what's important, whatever you do, it's process. And again, going back to my previous comment, it, it's about, you know, it's, it's an education, it's a learning process about whatever you do, even if it's confronting um, um, resistance. Um, this, and again, to think about you're going to um, overcome resistance, I think it's working with, that's what I mean by it. You're never going to eliminate resistance. If it was like that, then change would be much easier. But it, it transforms, it comes back, and also to recognize that it's always about two steps forward and one step back. And it's just the nature of the work. Maybe I can add. <laughs> Dasif uh, just mentioned something in the in the breakout room uh, that that I think it was Dasif uh, that resistance can can be good you know it's and, and Franz is also saying that you know if you have resistance in your organization it means that something is happening and of course it's not easy to deal with resistance and when that resistance happens uh, you need to be empowered to to deal with it you 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 somehow need tools or confidence or support from others from peers or people outside your organization uh, in order to help you uh, address um, resistance. So one way what could ha uh, happen is that you um, uh, organize an, an, a peer support group. And for instance, in the, in the Libra project I, I mentioned before, we had such a peer group where you could discuss issues uh, that happen in your organization and get feedback from others how to deal with that. Because, well, it, it was mentioned before, this, this kind of resistance, these issues, they happen in every organization, or most of the organizations in, in every country. Uh, so we, we have a lot in common, a lot of the problems we have in common, and we have a lot of experience among us. So I think it's really good to have some, some, some network uh, around you, inside the organization, outside the organization, to help you uh, come up with solutions if, if resistance uh, takes place happens. I also have, uh, if Francisco, can I go? Off? Okay, so I also have the comment to what exactly Franz said and Henry, and this is actually very much true that this is a process and we need to actually adopt ourselves to the process. And resistance 
is one of the mayor, as Henry also mentioned, this is one of the mayor. So we are going through the process and this is the mayor. If we are getting a resistance, it should be accepted. On the other hand, it should be confronted if there is a need. So it depends on the type of the resistance you are facing within your own organization, whether it's an individual or it's from the organization or from the hierarchy, from the leadership, then you have to make different kinds of strategies to address this kind of resistance. If it's individual, I mostly uh, used to say that uh, the individual resistance doesn't have to be addressed right away. It's not that crucial. But the organizational resistance within your own institute, within your own uh, environment, coming through the hierarchy needs to be addressed immediately. So like it's uh, some of the chronic diseases, I'm the medical <laughs> background as well. So we usually call that the chronic diseases needs a longer period of time to be addressed. And some of the acute diseases you have to address right away. If there is this needs to be perform a surgery, you need to do right away. And similarly, speaking up, it's a very difficult thing to do, but on the right time, on the right flow, the right discussion needs to be made. And that's the flow when there is the organization, uh, organizational resistance is coming up. But for the individual resistance, you have to be more of the representative and you have to address that resistance for a longer period of time and not slowly address the resistance. Take that resistance as your finding, as your measure that you're going in the right direction and keep going slow and steady. And don't push, usually uh, I myself is, uh, because I'm the data analyst and I usually rush to the results and want to have the immediate outcome. But that certainly doesn't work in the behavioral change and what the topic we are discussing at the moment. It may take some time, but Stay positive. Can I add something? Uh, th there was a mistake I made uh, when I started working on that is considering that we need to focus only <clears throat> on those that are resistant. And if you take 100 people, 100 men, for instance, you will have 10% of advocates. They will, they get it. They want to be active on it. Then you have 10% of people of men that are highly resistant and they will fight against you perhaps. And in the middle, you have 80% of people, they are neutral, they don't know what to do and how to do that, and they don't dare. The big mistake is to focus on the 10% of resistance only. The, the priority for me is really to uh, uh, use the power of the 10% of advocates, they can be role models, to attract some of the 80% 80, 80 of uh, uh, those they are in the middle, and step by step to doing so. <clears throat> Progressively, though they are resistant, they become the minority and uh, they may become silent. But we should not lose, not waste our energy by trying to engage those they are highly uh, um, fighting against uh, the, the topic. That, that would be a, a personal recommendation. Can I? Francisco, yeah. uh, Jean Michel, I totally agree with you. Yes. Uh, the same experience uh, is in our site too, the 10%, 80%, 10%. Yeah. Uh, but what I would like to mention is that not every country is in the same level of understanding of gender issues. So uh, it has to be bear in mind when someone will listen in us uh, from, from the record or, or now live uh, that. Um, we have to uh, differentiate and make a, a tailor-made approaches according to the uh, society and their maturity towards, towards gender uh, gender issues. For example, uh, we have to begin uh, begin on the very beginning uh, explaining the word gender. <laughs> that the gender is not a bad word. It uh, doesn't mean female only. It doesn't mean feminist. It, uh, uh, so we tried, or it is good to try to introduce the the yeah the very essence of our activities, the board gender, and what is behind in other connotations or different connotations. For example, uh, gender as a better research impact when talking about gender in content of research and innovation, or gender as a strategy to use uh, the rule 
whole pool of uh, disponible, of available people as a human resources for innovation, yeah? or gender as a, as a tool for new market opportunity, um, or uh, yeah, research results. So um, I think this is this is a problem and uh, yeah, it's of the differentiation and the different level of understanding what does it mean gender equality for the society we are living in. Yeah. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, maybe Maroon. Yes. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, of things have been said, but. Um, uh, I don't know if you are a runner, I'm a runner. And each time you go to run, you have to keep in mind that it's always difficult, never easy. And uh, it is a process, it takes time. Uh, for my experience, a few, when we used to go to, to office <laughs> last year, some, once uh, somebody told me, you work only with, uh, mainly with women. I told him, you are seeing that, uh, for me, I'm working with persons. I, I, I never noticed that I'm working only with women. It's a matter of uh, respect of, uh, of humankind. Uh, be, uh, this is why I insisted, and maybe my, my personal, uh, personal history, my grand-grandfather in Lebanon, in a, in, a, in a village in Mount Lebanon, made a, a school, uh, the first school in our village for uh, the children of farmers. It's about justice. Uh, if, you, if we deeply believe in justice and we uh, act in justice, I, I think we can convince and we can increase the critical mass uh, and at our uh, institution and uh, it will help us to soften a little bit the resistances and to achieve justice to everybody everybody as in gender smarts uh, our motto it's equality equality fits all benefit and benefits all uh, this is how, how we should deal it's not only a matter about improving uh, uh, gender but uh, the approach that we are i'm personally using that uh, things should be equal to everybody. And uh, if we are moving in a way, it will uh, bring uh, benefits to everybody. Thank you. Jean-Michel? Yeah, I see a question in the chat, uh, then how to attract some percentage of the neutrals. Um, big question. Uh, there is no easy answer except saying that it's one person at a time. I'm afraid we cannot have these big men playing in front of us, so lack of engagement of men and saying, okay, we will turn it to a positive way. We need to have conversation with, uh, with uh, people. And it would be true also for, for women because not all, all the women are, are committed. But uh, engaging one person at, at a time is the only way to do it. Which means that if, we are, if, if I'm alone to do it in my own company, that will take time. If we are 10 or 20, then we can influence 10 or 20 people. I don't think there is any other way, except of course, adding uh, uh, opportunities to, to, to come in, such as uh, gender networks, mentoring programs that are inclusive and so on, and other action and setting targets. But one person at a time, that's I'm deeply convinced of. Thank you. Franz, please. Just, just to build upon that, and I think what you're saying, um, Jean-Michel, it, it is about, again, getting back to that process. So saying, you know, what is the process? Part is, is the process of learning, socializing, um, and, and working with those early adopters. And of course, they're not working in, in they're making progress, but also not just in the silo. They're working in ways that you're socializing the idea. So you're yes you are working one person at a time but you're also changing the discourse of the discussion through the work of the early adopters and by engaging in the game for me when i think about process it's also about a learning process it's a socialization process so that's why this engaging with that and allowing for that as part of your efforts and it can't be time bound and i think to see for absolutely you're not going to frustrate me more than anything when people this process and say well what are the metrics 
you know, let's figure out what the change is first, then figure out what we want to measure and how we're going to measure it. You start right away from metrics, you've already determined the process, right? So it's also about how we go about thinking about this. Very interesting point. Um, yes, Tassif. I think Henry is the first, so I would go after. Well, uh, what I noticed in, in our organization is that uh, the younger uh, group leaders, the younger PIs, they are much more involved and, and appreciative of this issue. So, you know, it, I think it's, it's a good way to, to focus on them, to get them on board. Um, and they, they will then create a vibe uh, and, and discussion, which, which the, the, the people who are not so supportive, they cannot ignore it. Um, and especially if something positive happens, uh, celebrate it because everybody wants to be part of the, the celebration and be a part of the champion, you know? So it's really good to go out there and, and, sh and, and celebrate the, 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 the positive uh, developments. And th those are practical things that, that really work. Tassif, please. Thank you very much. As uh, Chian Michel said that um, you have to focus on those 10% who are actually advocating you or who uh, favors your ideas. And similarly, I would like to bring in uh, the attention of one of our recent study we just published in two weeks ago, and it's about the gender score. So I, I used to say, and our whole community used to say, gender is not binary. As someone also raised the question, how about the neutral uh, uh, gender? How would you talk about them? Gender is not, uh, uh, gender doesn't mean a binary dimension. It's not a male or female. Gender is actually a linear dimension. And thanks to the Canadian uh, Institute who developed this strategy of developing a gender score. Until now, we didn't have anything. Now we developed a gender score, which is from zero to 100. And interestingly, I'm trying to adopt the science, the medical science of this gender score into the social science. But we haven't experimented it. But we have experimented that the gender score we measured for the diseases, for the clinical outcomes, lies between like the first portion, one third, and the middle portion, and the third portion. What, I try, what I'm trying to make a point, we call the gender score lying close to the zero, is the masculine characteristics. And the gender score which lies close to the hundred is the feminine characteristics. And in between this bubble, we have the overlap. And this is very interesting to see this overlap. This overlapping means there are women who are actually having the masculine characteristics. And there are men who have feminine characteristics. So it doesn't have to be only a man or only a woman. So if we try to understand the phenomena of these overlapping people, they are mostly those people willing to contribute and they also have the personality traits that would come to gender identity. And this gender identity, they also share the identity being a woman of a man. Also a man shared the identity being a man still having the share from the woman. So they also have the feminine characteristics. So for now, for up till now in our society, in different cultural societies, we had gender roles. Like, okay, women needs to be uh, going through or going to the teaching roles and not taking the engineering jobs and not taking the leadership roles. But all of this is changing. We also saw the social change of the smoking habit. Now there are more women who uh, tends to smoke and it also involves the power. But what we need to learn from all of these steps is there is a change. There is an ongoing change and we can see with the data and it does reflect and we need to focus on one of the group, which is the overlapping. And we are in the majority. Unfortunately, we don't speak up. We don't speak out. And there is a majority of the group as well, which is overlapping, which stays neutral in most of the situations. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
Uh, I would now uh, kick off early the, the Q&A because there's been a very interesting question in the chat box of Conchettina that uh, explains that our organization has, has um, adopted the strategy on incentivizing gender equality because of the funds that come with it as evaluation criteria for, for example, European research funds and programs. Uh, but this only worked to a certain extent. Uh, she asks if you could suggest something more effective than this strategy. Maybe Henry, as you've been head of, uh, of an organization for quite a long time. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a very it's a very good point. Um, I I do see uh, some organizations who develop a gender equality plan and they tick the box and that's it. Um, and that's not an institutional change happening. So institutional change goes beyond the gender equality plan. It's, it's really the attitudes of uh, the people within the organization. <clears throat> and that, that's the most difficult part because writing a gender equality plan, you know, it's it's a, it's something everybody can do in the end. Uh, so you really should go beyond the, the funding. Uh, of course, it's a good driving force. I, I, I fully appreciate that. But try not to focus or see it as a tool to get funding. It's, it really should be an institutional change. Otherwise, um, you know, you do it and it ends up in a drawer and nothing really changes. And of course, then the question is how to elevate it to, a, to this institutional level. Uh, that it only works if you are able to involve um, yeah, the, the, the management of an organization in this that, that is willing to bring this, the change uh, within the organization. Uh, so involve uh, the, the, the leaders uh, within your organization. Can I, Francisco? <laughs> yes, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, yeah, how to be more effective when trying to be more <laughs> gender sensitive? Uh, I think it is very important to create uh, yeah, alliances on the national level between research performing organizations and research funders or the governmental bodies responsible for funding because uh, yeah, this is a strong a strong relationship. Uh, research funders, uh, what they have, they have money. <laughs> it means they have a power yeah, to set up conditions, rules, uh, measures, um, uh, guidelines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, this can uh, help to create changes on the other sides on the performing organizations. Of course, it has to be in line with the changes at research organizations and changes in the funding of organizations. And this all, of course, creates some yeah, ecosystem uh, on the European level. So we have to be in line as a founders with the rules of European Union and horizons, etc. Now uh, dealing with the gender equality plans as a conditions for uh, providing support. Uh, so I would suggest to, uh, to try to find uh, yeah, connections, alliances with the research funders and the research performing organizations, at least at the national or regional level in this regard. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to follow up this question? Maybe Maroon, in your specific, uh, in, in your specific research field, as it does not usually pertain to, to gendering. How, how could we put this in place? Actually, more, uh, more and more uh, uh, in, in, in agriculture uh, studies uh, are engaging more, more, uh, more women. And uh, especially in our institution, since we are international organization and dealing with Mediterranean countries, most of our students are are uh, are women because of uh, they see in studying and uh, pursuing uh, advanced studies a way to uh, enforce uh, their uh, social status so uh, 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 I think uh, 
we have to uh, make more emphasis on uh, on education and how to let people see this issue more normal than to be addressed like no you have to put quota for women and and uh, it's like uh, imposing uh, it, as i said it takes time but we have to uh, find a way to make it more natural in the process and uh, also we have to make good alliances with women and women have a lot of responsibility on that uh, they also should uh, struggle and help other persons struggling and uh, try to give the good examples and to be contagious in in their work Thank you very much. Uh, there's been an interesting question in the chat again for from Laurie. Uh, how do you gain the support of men when you are trying to introduce women only programs or initiatives? This uh, uh, affirmative action is sometimes not seen very positively by management and, and otherwise uh, people with responsibilities in the organization. I think you can make a, business, a positive business case to engage senior men, but I'm thinking more about men on the ground floor. So. How, how do we how do we put this forward? Does any of you have any insights on the matter? I can start answering uh, about those uh, only women uh, um, initiatives. I would say uh, don't do it. Uh, do things that are inclusive. And by the way, if I had a general advice to give, is move from diversity to inclusion. Uh, just uh, because you will have always resistance regarding diversity, uh, but on inclusion, nobody will dare to challenge the fact that people need to feel uh, included to give the, their best. So that's, uh, that's true. And on these programs dedicated to women only, I, I think there is a, a trap here. Um, I've done it uh, in the past. For instance, the first mentoring programs we did where I was with Sodexo was for women only. And we, we did it once and realized that we needed to open it uh, uh, to men too. And that's what we did. Even if uh, the decision was made to over-represent women in this program, because there was a gap. And where there is a gap, you, and there is no, let's say, convincing explanation to this gap, you need to, to um, um, actively uh, um, uh, push for uh, the underrepresented, uh, uh, population which may be men for instance in some uh, in some uh, uh, jobs such as uh, uh, hr communication for instance in uh, in private countries but i i always advise to avoid women only programs or men only programs that's not inclusion thank you france um maybe a little pushback <laughs> jean michel I, I guess i wouldn't be so categorical categorical um i think there's a time and place for um, gender specific initiatives, depending on what the issue is being addressed in the context of the organization and the receptivity. Absolutely, there are lots of examples of when those type of niches have backfired and or have been executed in a fixing the women type of approach. But there certainly are certain cases where um, solidarity, collective action, collective agency is needed for groups that have been historically and traditionally marginalized. Now, do you do that, and it's how it's done. Do you do that in a way that suddenly tomorrow we're having a, you know, whatever quota? No, I think you need to understand that within wider change processes. And of course, not waiting for the right time because then you could wait forever, but actually waiting for the right moments. And when you can, or creating the right moments, when when you need to be um, having this through and that's when just very quickly you know that's where our understanding of gender is yes you know we understand we probably have very different understandings of gender amongst us and i think when you understand gender as a social relation and understanding why you may have women focused programs it is within an organization context and the quote unquote norms of the organization and one needs to understand that um again but i will also say that it doesn't work in the reverse I would probably go with you and saying, do you need men only groups? I think you need different structures and ways of working with men.
interesting pushback and discussion. Henry, I see you've uh, switched on your microphone. Would you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with, with Franz. I, I think it's it's very much um, dependent on the situation. Uh, also, Jean-Michel, I, I, personally, I, I think it's not good to have these women-only programs, but in some cases, it really works very well and it really helps to, uh, to develop to the next level. We, we, we set up a program for um, career development of, of very high potential postdocs, female postdocs. And a lot of them did really made the next step. I don't know whether it would have happened without this peer group that, that helped them to, uh, to gain maybe confidence, set up networks, etc. It was a women only uh, group and it really worked. So I fully support France say, Let's let's be not too dogmatic about it, but in some cases, I also really support Jean Michel. It should be about equal opportunities, and that's that we should aim for as much as possible. Can I add something uh, concerning the uh, yeah uh, greater participation of women in research? Uh, we created uh, in a funding organizations one program which is actually not focused on female only, but on the gender balanced research teams. Yeah? And when we are uh, talking about gender balance, it means for both men and women. Uh, I, would, I would say maybe, uh, maybe a link on the, uh, in the chat, because we created uh, a tool how to assess the balance. Yeah? What does it mean and when it is balanced and when it is not balanced, etc. We call it the gender matrix, uh, and it contains uh, also uh, a little bit advancement of uh, female principal investigators. But in general, it is focused on both sexes, and the aim is to create uh, gender balanced uh, results in a research team. Uh, and I would also agree that the female only programs could be very tricky and we could fall in trap very quickly and really be able to explain why we are doing it. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I would suggest to, uh, to use rather the principles of uh, balance or inclusion as uh, Jean-Michel said. So here is the link in chat. Francisco, can I add uh, something please? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I totally agree that uh, um, we don't have to make uh, uh, we don't have to be to believe that there is one solution to to everything. I will give you I will give you an example. Uh, since we are dealing with international international cooperation, uh, if I ask you, we are we are going to make a training on irrigation management in Egypt. You might think, okay, we will we, we will uh, invite men, but actually, women are running irrigation in Egypt because people, men are coming to the city to work and women are managing farms. So uh, uh, we have to be open. We have to study, uh, and uh, we have to avoid prejudice and to avoid ready-made packages to implement it everywhere. And uh, by doing alliances between uh, persons, we can uh, make things uh, change and uh, to be patient because it takes time oh, and uh, it, it will never be easy. Thank you. Jean-Michel has switched on his microphone. Do you want to uh, I just thought, I think it's a, it's a very interesting discussion. I, I get your point. I, I don't want to be seen as a, let's say, a integrist of, of inclusion, but still, you, I think that there is a way to look at the situation, which is using this uh, flip it to test it way. So would we do the same for other dimensions? So women on the program, would we do men on the program? Would we do programs only for, let's say, black people, for uh, uh, some uh, religious or minorities? That's always the issue is uh, uh, looking at a, um, a particular 
part of uh, the, the, the world is always, uh, can always be challenging. So, and I, I think there is a, a way to do it, which is more inclusive. So that's an opinion. Um, and I'm not saying that 100% work, but I've seen things uh, happening in France with uh, men uh, networks being launched. And actually, it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work uh, because it's not exactly the same. I think there is a room for gender open uh, networks where you can have safe spaces for women only, for instance, because I think on, on networks, there is a need for safety in, uh, in some discussions, which may be the case for men too. But at least they need to belong to a, a, some um, a common uh, thing, which may be a, a, a gender open uh, network and not only a woman's network or a men's network. But if you have both, you need a, a supra network to unify the two, which is, I'm not sure, that productive. Yes, Franz, please. Um, so I'd like to call on uh, our, my fellow panelists to be a bit for us to practice some self reflexivity. And it's great that we're having different opinions, but at the end of the day, I would just ask women, what do they want? Does it work for them? So let's not be as a male dominated panel making decisions for others. And I think that's just a general practice. I appreciate you're not, and we're not doing that, but just to also recognize that we should be self-reflective and let's ask people what works, what works for them. Let's not make decisions. And it's just idea also being conceptually clear. And I think that's what we can do as, as gender advocates who happen to be men. So what are we talking about when we talk about equal opportunity? Absolutely, we should provide an equal opportunity, but we know what really counts is equality in results, equality in outcomes. And yes, and I think that's a very kind of liberal sort of approach to, to change, to equal opportunity. And we know that you come to the opportunity with a very differently socially positioned based on gender and other intersectionalities. So to say equal opportunity, I think is only part of the picture. Let's be conceptually clear. I guess the other one that I that I would also like to um, caution us is not creating false equivalents. Establishing groups for disenfranchised, traditionally historically disenfranchised population is not the same as establishing groups of, of those in privilege. They're not, so we can't make that argument, would we do it for others? Let's look at the particular context and to also understand gender as a cross-cutting form of discrimination is intersectional. So I think we dilute or lose the, the discussion and the focus when we start asking about, you know, do we talk about um, race or, or religion or other ways? Yes, they're similar, but they are different. And let's, ask, let's talk about the specificity of gender discrimination and its requirements for very specific measures. Again, particular, not different. I'm not saying they have to be different, but they are particular. Thank you. Are you? Yes, yes, Marcel. Uh, yeah, when talking about uh, self-reflexivity, it's something comes <laughs> in my mind, and I'm very, really, very hesitant if I should open this question or not, because it is a very sensitive topic, but in the same time, very effective. When we are talking about engaging men in uh, gender issues, and this is actually uh, yeah, to use the, the kind of controversial strategy, using the patriarchy stereotypes as a tool for engaging men in gender issues, to have them on board, and then to start to change the approaches or mindset or uh, awareness rising. Uh, I'm talking about playing with own cards when talking about gender issues. That is a first stage. And then to start to be serious and correct about the gender, gender strategy. I'm talking about, uh, for example, invitations, uh, decision-making level, men's in a prestigious international conference to talk about gender issues because we are dealing with it. Yeah, our bosses, which are, uh, um, which might be uh, resistant, or uh, um, yeah, manage some meeting with a with, with a politician with high positions talking about gender issues suddenly, yeah, first time in life, or some decision makers in organization, or simply give them credit for the gender related work uh, and engagement. I. 
Unfortunately, in my experience, it works how to engagement as the first approach. But I think it is in the same time very controversial because you are pushed to use the stereotypes, the patriarchy in order to engage men in gender equality issues. Yeah. Uh, so um, this is very sensitive questions and uh, you have to be very, um, very conscious if you, uh, you would like to use this strategy or not. Yeah. Thank you. Any spontaneous Tassif, please? I would just add my two cents, uh, having said by Maroon as well as uh, Marcel and Jen Michal, that I'm also glad that I'm the part of the diverse panelists. So, so it, the diversity is everything. And somebody also put into the chat, what do you mean, Jan, by um, having diversity to inclusion? I would rather say, Jan can better uh, respond, but I would just say that diversity and inclusion may be used as synonym to each other, but the inclusion is more specific and sensitive to bring the men into the discussion and into the environment or into the uh, uh, criteria. As per the discussion about having only women only events or women only strategies, as we have seen that the irrigation department from the Egypt, and my friend said, Marcel, Maroon said that uh, only women or most of the women were invited. So this is the question about the context. And it's important what content is being delivered in which context and in which culture. So the whole diversity and the inclusion would shape itself according to the given society, culture, and the community. So if it is appropriate in your situation that you have to only hold a discussion about the woman, I believe women can be a changing change agent. Sorry for uh, using a lot of medical terms, but the change agent or the catalyst is something which can work at the root level, starting from the bottom. All of the women, they have their household or they belong to a house and they do have their connections to a man in the form of maybe a father, maybe uh, a brother, if not, maybe a husband. So we can't deny the fact that we are all interlinked. So just I'm trying to be as layman as possible. Uh, I think the change could be from any place, whether it's only women only or men only. But of course, the appropriate and the inclusive approach would be to have men as an ally to your own uh, uh, change and within the society and the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tassif. We're now nearing the end of our session. I uh, see Jean-Michel would like to intervene. Maybe we'll get to uh, closing comments or statements to provide a general overview and then I'll summarize. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to say uh, to, to Marcel's point, I, I, I think it's important to use uh, the, the real status of, of men. And uh, when I work with catalysts with the mark advocating for a real change, uh, one of the, the main point is uh, addressing the question of, uh, of uh, privileges, which is a very sensitive topic. Uh, and because we know that men have privilege, but we refuse to see, to see it, is how we can uh, encourage men to use their privilege to, uh, to promote gender equality. That's at the, at the end of the day, very, uh, very effective. Uh, and to, for the question between diversity and inclusion, diversity is counting people and uh, inclusion is making people people count. If I had to, to, to summarize it, it's not my creation, but I, I love this one, which means that you can measure diversity by counting people and you can count uh, gender balance at all the levels of your organization. Inclusion is a bit different because it's asking people how they feel. And uh, people tend to refuse to count the number of people due to cultural aspects or whatever. But when it's about uh, measuring engagement of people, so the, the perception of inclusion, then it works. And uh, I, I saw the question about the, the, the executive committee of a university, probably you know, moving from diversity and inclusion and asking people, what do you want uh, to have uh, uh, in your teams, committed people or not committed people? And if you look at the data 
uh, in my experience, I mean, if you uh, investigate in companies in organization, there is a gap in terms of uh, inclusion, perception of inclusion between men and women. I just discovered an exception with one of my clients, but usually there is a big gap. And that's a, a, a call for action. Interesting. Franz, you had a comment? Yeah, maybe it's a, a bit late, but I think we try to join it with uh, Jean-Michel's uh, comments. Um, so thanks for that clarification about diversity inclusion. And, and for me, um, when we're talking about change and creating greater equity, it's also about a willingness and openness to change the structures that create that inequity. So when I think about issues, and, and I'm so maybe pulling from my Canadian roots, um, you know, when we think about inclusion, it's often about how do we ensure that people are included in the systems that the status quo. Well, for me, when I think about diversity, in my understanding, diversity is a, is a preferred term. It's about actually thinking about the status quo and reflecting about how it can work, as you say, for everybody. So whatever term we use, as long as we're not saying that and getting back to engaging men um, and or engineer quality, it's about how to make people work for the status quo. The problem is the status quo. And that's what we need to be engaging with in transformative change. We haven't talked so much about that through this process about, about engaging men. Engaging men in what? For me, it's about engaging men in gender transformative change. And that's looking at the structures, whether you want patriarchy and equity across broad um, and processes thereof. And so then we start not getting into this zero sum power, zero sum understanding of power. So winning and losing, because that's when you get the issues about the problems with quotas, but how do we create actually a different way of thinking about power and sharing power and where there is general societal benefit without making that a saccharine kind of, kind of wishy-washy, lovely thing to, you know, thing to say. It is about a struggle and let's struggle with this together. Thank you. Very, very interesting notion to end. Exactly. Tony, Tony Craig put it uh, on the chat box. Tossi, if you had, you had your hand raised, did I say it correctly? Not really, but I can definitely uh, oh, agree sorry. to the point uh, funds uh, really mentioned. This is, uh, I think, one of the core thing we all need to uh, agree and there is no other way. Thank you. So uh, does any of our panelists want to uh, conclude their interventions here? Otherwise I'll summarize or try to. Maroon, please. No, no, I, I, I appreciated the, uh, all the comments by the colleagues and as the friends uh, uh, said, it's about uh, changing and power, but uh, we should not see power as a negative issue. Power is also about uh, responsibility. If we have power, we have to be responsible. Uh, and uh, be responsible to change and uh, to make things uh, moving. So uh, each time um, we, uh, we are acting, uh, we uh, should be aware uh, that our actions might have some uh, negative effects on, on others. So uh, merging the power and responsibility together, it's also a concept that can help us in uh, more inclusion, as has been well said by Jean-Michel, and to induce change and to make our, our world uh, better. Thank you. Thank you, Maroon. So We've had a very interesting and diverse discussion, very valuable and different insights and points of view. I would just like to uh, leave a, a few key that I uh, consider, a few aspects that I consider key, key in, this, um, in this discussion. The point, for example, Franz made a few times about self-reflexivity and how it all starts within uh, a journey of one's um, a perception of what power of what uh, inequality might be and and then th there's been the discussion of using data to this purpose of of engaging in self -ref reflexivity but as we're trying to develop gender gender equality we should remember that uh data is not the end it's a means to an end the end is change and we should keep that in mind know what we are trying to do knowing the reality in order to change it which is our key goal so 
And we start with the early adopters. There's been a very interesting discussion on that and changing one person at a time, as Jean-Michel put it, very interesting, this, this kind of um, ripple effect we can have with change and starting to engage with our peers and, and people who are involved in, in our institution at, at various levels. Um, and we do see that there are a few different uh, perspectives on how to engage with gender equality and feminism. It's, it's uh, the, the most common uh, aspect we do have. And of course, it has to be specific to institutions and standpoints and whatever we, we see. Very interesting discussion as well on affirmative action. It's, we seem to uh, be on, on the border between, okay, this is uh, something that might be needed. And Jean-Michel effectively explained how inclusion could be um, uh, a different concept on how to think about this, this, these topics. Maybe we can reflect on this and maybe later on have, have a, a, different, um, a different discussion. Thank you very much to all of you for, for participating. If any of you wants to um, give, uh, give some other conclusion, I'll leave you because we're here to hear you, not me. Thank you very much. Please. Henry, please. please. Henry, please. Uh, Henry, please. Well, well, thank you for, for the, the summary and all the other participants and also the, the people uh, putting questions in the chat. It's very, very interesting uh, topic. And to conclude, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive because I do see that a lot of change is, is happening. And of course, we all like to have it uh, happen faster. But uh, there are changes in, in, in the good direction. So I think that's something um, we should uh, keep in mind and, and not um, not lose faith in, in working on this. Exactly. The notion we discussed earlier about it being a process and maybe a marathon as a, a, a running metaphor, as Maroon suggested. Tosif, you wanted to say something? Well, I just wanted to conclude myself in a way that uh, it's uh, obviously it's a process. We need the implementation that needs to be monitored, reported, and evaluated. Also, one of the commenter uh, also said our colleague Carolina from Sweden also mentioned about a few of the facts. And this is actually a continuous norm, a continuous uh, activity or sustainability would come only once we are uh, working consistently on the hardcore issues within ourselves and within the environment we live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone to, to, that has come by and participants for posing questions, for listening, paying attention and for your work into creating a, a fairer global society, hopefully. And thank you for all the panelists and the organizers. This has been for me and surely for every one of us a very enriching experience. 